Hey guys, it's PC Purrs, Pussycat Purrs, and I am going to review season two, episode six of P Valley today. If you're new to my channel, then welcome. I am a pole dancer, pole competitor, enthusiast, all that instructor. So if you are into pole and things pole related, you're in the right spot. This episode of P Valley was super, super heavy. It dealt with a lot of issues like um, people getting out of jail and what their reality is once they get out. It touches on suicide, of course, domestic abuse, which we've been going through. Just a whole lot of things in this episode. Teen pregnancy, I mean, so many things. So if you're triggered by those things, then be warned. Please excuse my neighbors. If you hear singing and stuff like that, I. I cannot control that. These people that live across from me, they do what they want when they want. So huh, forgive me. This episode, I would say we definitely continue with the whole doorway thing. Like I've been telling you guys how we keep getting characters in doorways at moments when they're revealing like deep, deep information about their makeup. And so this episode is definitely like no deviation from that. Um, we get to see Teak in a closet. I mean, it's not a doorway, but it's the same type of structure. And we really, really get like an intimate look on his life and like why he is the way that he is. But let's get to that later. Let's start with how the episode starts, which is with Diamond <laughs> and Big Bone getting it cracking. And I told y'all last week, I would pay to see the two of them getting it on because there was two pretty people and just two very sexy people. And so I was not disappointed. Like the chemistry was there, at least in the beginning. And then we see that Diamond is still thinking about Mercedes, so he can barely, not Mercedes, Mississippi. And so he can barely look at Big Bone in the face. Like he's looking away, he's distracted. And she keeps trying to turn his face to get his attention, but he just flips it over, finishes, smacks her on the butt, and he's done. And I would have been so mad if I was her. Like that is so selfish, not thinking about somebody else and letting them do what they need to do, get what they need to get out of the situation. And she's still like warning him. So, you know, she's wandering around the house and trying to touch his voodoo objects. And he's telling her not to do that. I mean, she calls him on the fact that he was probably playing Captain Saber, you know what, for some girl. And she can tell by his eyes. And so they keep messing around. But I don't know. Ladies, let me know how you feel about that. I mean, he's pretty and all that. But <sighs> that, that would have turned me off. I don't know. Maybe it was an in the moment thing. But... So then next is the start of Big Teak and Lil Murder's day together. And it starts off, it reminded me of Nelly's tip drill video. It was just like a parking lot and a bunch of people around with cars and just like dancing. But it was, I guess, a gathering. I think I saw Johnny Blaze too in that scene, looking so thick. She looks so cute. Anyway, I digress. Um, it's like a big meeting, like everybody together. And Lil Murder gave Teak a car. This camo, red, green, and black car. And it just meant so much to Teak. Like, we keep seeing, like, with Teak, it's almost like his emotions are sitting, like, at the very top of his skin. Like, he seems so fragile, so, like, ready to explode at any moment, even though he is so aggressive and so dangerous. He always seems like he's about to crack, like, in his eyes and always so overcome with emotion. And it makes me so nervous whenever he's on screen because he seems like just a live wire. So he gets the car and he starts to cry and murder like gives him a moment. And you can just see like everything seems to mean so much to him. Like he never thought he would get these things and be able to be a part of these things. And it was just making me nervous for a little murder because I'm like, this guy obviously can't stick around. Like, He's gonna pull you down. So we, I feel like we know he's gotta go. He can't stick around. So then we see, um, it's like Cliff, Big L, and Autumn. And Autumn is trying to get ready to go out to an event and they don't know what her next move is. Like she's just moving funny. They don't trust her. They know that they can't really get rid of her because of all the things that they've done because of the murder and things like that. But it's just uncomfortable for them. So they've got their eyes on her. We're like, where is she going? Because we see this fancy dress. And it's like, all right. And then we jump back to date day with um, Lil Murder and Teak. And they're in the barbershop and Teak is getting his hair done by fire. Literally the hot headed person has got a head full of hellfire. They're, they're using the fire to cut his hair. And it's so appropriate because 
He's tormented. It's like flames in his head, fire in his head. He's hot headed. He's in his own personal hell. So if anybody was going to get their hair cut by fire, which is crazy, it would be him. And we haven't seen this for any other character. So we know it's intentional for T. And I just kept feeling like he is in hell. Like he's got demons in him. He's in hell. He's on fire. Like when you see him overwhelmed, it just felt like that. And I'm just sitting there watching and thinking, this is not good. And even in the barbershop, they're talking about death and somebody who just right away was gone. And I'm like, they're setting this up for something. And in between that, we're getting cut with Lil Myrtle on the phone with uh, Miss Mississippi. And she's telling him what happened with Rome and how his manager now knows about him and Teak. And her phone gets disconnected. And her boyfriend is like, who's on the phone? You know, he's scared because he just finished beating her up. She's got bruises and stuff all over the face. And he's going out for a job and asked her if she wanted to go. And she's like, hmm, my face. I can't. And so he leaves, but he's acting very, very weird. Well, and then when T comes out from the barbershop and they talk about what's going to happen for the rest of the day. And Lil Murder says he was going to kick it with Teak that day. And Teak is looking like, Oh, wow, I wasn't expecting this, but all right, let's do it. And at the same time, Lil Murder, we can tell he feels indebted to T and he doesn't want to leave him. But at the same time, he knows like this is not good if his secrets are exposed. So in my head, I'm like, he knows T can't be there, but he also feels like I, I can't escape him. I can't really let him go. So then we get back to Mercedes and she goes to visit, um, Tarika's mom and bring groceries and stuff. Tarika's not there and there's no food in the refrigerator. Tarika's mom is drunk, of course, and she confronts her about calling Tarika a mistake. And she tells her, you know, you kind of live in right now. Why don't you let me take Tarika for a little bit? And the woman is completely against it. And we already know she she's raised her out of duty, like in a sense of obligation, not because she wanted to. And I mean, I know if you raise a child, you gotta love it and stuff like that, or at least you should. But that girl is is an older teenager now. She clearly wants her mom. This woman clearly has issues with being her parent, her custodial parent. She should let the girl spend some time with her mom, in my opinion. I don't I don't think it's fair for her to just hoard her all to herself like that because of anger or resentment or jealousy, whatever. Let me know what you think about that. But I think she's being unreasonable with that. And then so Mercedes is frustrated with that. She gets a call from Tarika, but Tarika hangs up so they don't get through. And then she gets on the phone and then the coach calls her. And he's like, oh, what that Mercedes experience. Interact with my wife so, some more. I like it. And this, that, and the third. She's like, oh, this is so much more than I bargained for. And I would be so annoyed with the coach. He's so corny. Mercedes experience. It's like, if you don't get yourself out of here, you thirsty old dude, just... And no, no issues with older men. Just like, this dude is just corny and he annoys the hell out of me. Let me know what you think about him. I'm over the coach. Also, this coach is way different than the coach last season. Last season wasn't the coach. He was a dark skinned guy. I feel like he was not American and he was a lot younger. This season, the coach is an older, lighter man. But I'm just like, we just, we just jump characters like that. All right, put an Aunt Viv on us. Next stop on the Little Murder Big Teak day and they go to this chicken spot to have some lemon pepper wings wet <laughs> and again it just all seems to mean so much to teak they're having a conversation and little murder gets a little bit jealous when the waitress is flirting with teak but they're talking and little murder is like so this is a date and teak's eyes are like that actor's eyes are so full of expression and his eyes are just saying like this is my dream. Like, I never thought I'd be able to be on a date out in public with Lil Murder and I'm here and this is happening. And this day just seems to have a lot of weight on Teak. And they start having a conversation about so many important things, especially with people getting released from prison because they start talking about Uncle Clifford and Teak is like, tell me about your dude. And he's like, well, she, she, yeah, she, he, I, I respect her as what she wants to be called. And Teak is like, man, so many things have changed in 10 years. And that's the reality, not just with sexuality and, and pronouns and things like that, but just the reality of 10 years, so much changes with technology and 
even the people in your life. For example, Lil Murder's moved on. He's got a new love interest. Teek's heart seems to be with Lil Murder, but Lil Murder's, even though he's connected to him, has moved on. His heart is somewhere else. And Teek is dealing with all the issues of his past because we know he's troubled by his actions, but also just feeling a feeling of like not fitting in in the world that you're in. Like he definitely needed to come out and have some type of support system other than just like a party. I'm sure that might have made things even worse. Like you come out and life is not just different, but drastically different. Your friend that was in prison with you is now on the path to becoming a superstar and you don't know how to work current technology. It must feel like such like a drastic change. And even during the conversation, when Lil Murder is talking to Teek about Cliff, he describes Cliff in such a way that you can see the jealousy in Teek's eyes and also the pain. And Lil Murder is talking about how he messed things up and how he messes things up a lot. And you know that that has something to do with Teek. And he reaches, Lil Murder reaches out to touch Teek's hand and it's the first time we see him pull away. And they both have like this pain strain look on their face. And then Teek reaches out and touches his nose and tells him that all is forgiven. And it started like to feel like at this moment for me, like Teek is settling things in his life. Like, all right, if I had a chance, I would tell this person this. If I had a last day, I would do this. My, my theme song for Teek this episode is a song by Mace. If I had 24 hours to live, what would you do? Who would you school? Who did? That song. If you don't know that song, check it out. It's Mace and some other people on it. 24 hours to live, I believe is the song. So then we go back to Miss Mississippi. And finally, she's trying to leave. And she gets her, her gun that she has hidden out of the secret location. She leaves her phone because she knows Derek tracks her phone. So it'll say that she's still there. And she um, gets the kids together. They get in the car and the engine won't start. And then she realizes Derek has <laughs> disabled the car. I think he took the engine out. So she's literally trapped. I said, call somebody. Call your stepmama who don't like you. Call. She needs to call Diamond. Diamond would come quick, fast, and handle anything that she got going on. But she's not doing that. So she just went back home, defeated, and waited for Derek to come home. And it was very sad, but also scary. Next stop on the date, they go to a gas station. So Lil Murder is trying to show teeth, you know, new updates with pumping gas. And then they hear on the radio from another car, Lil Murder's on the radio, so they get amped. And then Teek, of course, has one of these, it almost seems like a, not a panic attack, but just like this sense of overwhelm. Like the camera gets close on him and it's like disorienting. It's like very close and the sound goes out. So you know it's like overwhelmed for him. And even though he doesn't look pained, he looks like a mix of things, almost tormented. And you see the joy and the happiness, but also like pain in it. It's like so many things going on with Teek and it feels like he's close to a mental breakdown at any moment. And even in the happiness, somebody else comes up and they're like, can we get some gas? And Teek is ready to go off and murder has to stop him. He can't stay with them. You can't constantly police a grown, strong ass man like that, like and keep you from fighting all the time. That's too much. He needs help. <laughs> he doesn't need to be going on the road or on a tour. Then we go back to the pink and we start seeing cracks in this friendship with Roulette and Whisper. And they always say it's hard to make friends in the club. And so they just started getting money together and working as a team. And I hate to see this happen, but they were on stage and Roulette is getting some shine. Not Roulette. Whisper is getting some shine. And Roulette looks over and she seems a little jealous, a little envious. So she takes off her shoes and she starts doing some really, really advanced tricks to put the attention back on her. And Whisper notices it, but it's like, why are you doing all that sense? I thought we are a team. And then when Roulette gets off the stage, her customer that we saw her having like sexual interactions with in the club is asking her about Whisper. So now she's even more jealous. And it's like, <clears throat> I guess from his perspective, he's looking at it as a service. Like, well, you do this, what about your homegirl? And she's looking at it like, how dare you ask me about her? Go handle that yourself. I mean, I see both ways. I, I do think it's kind of rude, but Roulette needs to, I mean, I don't know. I don't, I don't like her not getting along with Whisper. I think that's kind of petty, especially if y'all getting money together. But let me know what you think. And do you think it's rude for that guy to come to her to ask for 
services from Whisper? Or should he handle that himself? I'm team go handle that yourself, but I, I guess he figures she's the plug since that's her friend. But I don't know. Let me know what you think. So then we start going back and forth between Mercedes getting ready to sleep with the coach and his wife and Autumn getting being all dressed up and going to this big house for a masquerade party. And then we find out that it's actually Andre trying to get um, endorsements for him running for mayor. She got in, by the way, by using the wife's name because she knew Andre's wife wasn't going to be there. <laughs> that was cute. But um, I think it's Corbin tries to get her kicked out of the party. And then when we're back at the house that belongs to the coach and his wife, he's sleeping with Mercedes. Mercedes and the wife, like basically the wife helps Mercedes finish, you know, like the coach is doing his thing, looking kind of weak, looking like weak strokes. And, you know, the wife helps finish Mercedes off. The coach notices it and is like, no, y'all done this before. Gets jealous and gets mad. He and the wife start getting into a fight about how he doesn't know that she likes women and she's mad about just their dynamic is messed up. Mercedes decides to jump in. Yeah, what about her dreams? And I'm like, girl, why did you not just start packing your stuff and leave? Like your job is done, right? Go get your money and leave. And then of course the coach gets mad, get out of my house. Like, why are you joining in with her? And she's like, no, you owe me my 40 stats. And he's like, no, I'm not giving it to you. And the wife kind of co-signs like, oh, I can't make him do anything. And I was so mad because let me tell you, Look at the seriousness in my face. If I was supposed to leave that house with $40,000, I'm not leaving that house without my $40,000. Feel me? <laughs> she, I, first of all, I don't understand why Mercedes didn't get her money up front. Like, he came out with it in her plate and she's like, okay, you guys are ready for the Mercedes experience. No, she should be like, okay, thank you. She should have put that in her suitcase. Now y'all are ready for the Mercedes experience. I am 100% sure not getting your money up front is breaking one of Uncle Clipper's rules because in the strip club, you get your money up front. She, we've seen her, even the first episode of season one, negotiating, I think it was the first episode with Lil Murder, when he was like, oh, I got these stacks, how much, how much you got in the bag? Let me get the bag. And she got her money up front. Who always get your money up front. You don't know what can go left, especially like these threesome situations. Everybody knows, right? Whether you had a threesome or not, that somebody might get jealous and a problem might go down. So she should have anticipated all these things and her money was supposed to be the priority. And she let the wife and the coach and all that get in her head and she did not get her money and she played herself hard and I felt so bad for her. She didn't even fight it, she just left. Let me tell you something, that was the time to pull out your phone and start recording. He's a prestigious coach, I'm about to go, I would go live. I'm in this house, about to show your face, you don't give me my money, I will, what? She could even call the cops. Prostitution is not illegal. She might get arrested, but she'd probably get out or something like that sometime soon. But it would be a public record of what he did on file. Like his reputation would be messed up. He'd be like, you better give me my money or you're going to have some problems, buddy. So I don't, I don't know. I know it's a TV show, but she was just not thinking straight at all. And she lost out on $40,000 and got played. She literally just got screwed. She got chopped and screwed and did not get paid. And I feel just like, ugh. Like, if you're going to do that type of work, you should be compensated for it. That is, like, the most intimate type of work you can do with somebody. You should get paid. That is ridiculous that he did not want to pay her. And she did her job. Not her fault. Like, no refunds, buddy. Give me my money. I'm going to stop talking about it. So then we see Roulette outside smoking in her car. You know she's feeling some type of way. And then Duffy comes out. I'm dead wrong. I did not even remember Duffy from last season. He was messing with Gidget last season. Y'all remember that? I forgot all about that. But anyway, so he, and I knew he liked them strippers. I knew he liked them strippers. So then, them scrupers. So then he's trying to talk to Roulette and he's like, I feel you. She's like, I feel you too. I'm gonna let you know I'm a hook. And I respect her keeping it a hundred because it's not like she could hide it. And he's in and out of her job where she's turning the tricks. It was like, <laughs> living out loud. He said, oh, well, you know, that's a coinky dick. Cause me too, baby. <laughs> they start kissing and I'm here for Duffy and Roulette I, they seem like a walking train wreck but I don't care like it's either gonna work really well or be really really bad but I, I'm here for Duffy and Roulette let me know if you're here for Duffy and Roulette I'm team Duffy and Roulette like I'm, I'm very much invested in their story at this point so then we see Miss Mississippi at home defeated and Derek comes home and he knows that she knows and they had this really just 
awkward back and forth. I mean, a lot of it, he's standing over her and it just feels like this ominous presence. Like it feels like he's about to hit her then. Basically the whole scene is just him letting her know that he's in control and he's in power and she has none. From them, we go to Lil Murder and Teak in the car and Teak hops out to go into a trap house. And Lil Murder's on the phone with his manager and his manager in the conversation kind of lets it be known that uh, Rome died of an overdose. So it sparks Lil Murder to go, how do you know? And then his manager also tells him like, Teak can't come, he's a liability. He's a hothead, we can't deal with that, he's gotta go. Like he's gonna, he's gonna sink the ship. And Little Murder is like, we can't, he just got out of jail, but I'll handle it. When he gets off the phone, he opens up the glove compartment and finds Teak's gun and takes it. Inside the trap house, Teak is walking around and we're just hearing sounds come at him. Again, it's disorienting. And it seems like he's familiar with this place. Like he's got childhood memories from this place. He walks to a closet and here we go with the doors again. You know, uh, we talked about the whole doorway thing and revealing people's character. And he opens up the door to the closet and sees himself as a child standing there with blood. And it's like, he has got childhood trauma, something serious. And Lil Murder finds him, tells him to come outside and ask him what he's doing in the trap house without his gun and hands him the gun. And as soon as he hands him the gun, I'm like, subconsciously, Lil Murder wants him to die. In his heart, he feels connected to him. He wants him around. But when you are rationally thinking, given a hot-headed person that you know needs to exit your life, who is super emotional, a gun, in some way, shape or form, that is gonna most likely result in their demise. And I'm like, this is the moment that's gonna happen. And I started thinking that I don't know if he's gonna get into a situation with somebody or if he's gonna kill himself. But Teak is not long for this show. Like, for the world of the show, Teak is not gonna be here long. That was just such a pivotal moment. And I'm like, why would you do this? But even, and that's why I say it subconsciously because even though Lil Murder has been saying, I can't, like, we can't let him go. It's something in his eyes that's saying, he don't belong here and he can't stay, but I, I can't do it, you know? And so when they're outside of the trap house, Teak tells him, you know, this used to be my house. And Lil Murder is telling him, you know, that was your past, we're going on tour tomorrow. And Teak is just, he's got this look in his face and he's shaking his head like, nah, no, I don't. And, and I feel like we all knew something wasn't right. Lil Murder knows something's not right, but they keep going on this day. So then we're back at Andre's event. Autumn is outside because she's been kicked out and she winds up getting back in with Miss Batson. The casinos are hers. She wants the casinos to go up. So basically, once she gets her way in the room, she's able to let the woman know that, you know, it's a good thing y'all didn't acquire the paint before for that low number because the press would have gotten wind of it and it would have looked like you guys were trying to take advantage of poor minorities during a really bad time. But, you know, we know the property is worth She gets Andre to like, mm-hmm, that's what it's worth close on with her. And then the woman is like, you know what? We want to handle this. I will talk to you later. And Andre can get her uh, endorsement for mayor. So basically everybody got what they wanted, but Kyle is upset because he doesn't like the fact that Autumn was involved in this. Good job, Autumn. She's not my favorite character, but that was very, I love her business savvy and her hustle. <laughs> So then we have some of my favorite scenes, Cliff and Grandma. And Grandma's at home coughing up a storm. And I'm like, we know she got COVID. Grandma, COVID ain't real. COVID is just a man's way. Grandma got COVID. And Cliff calls up Toy. And Toy clearly has COVID. So he's like, I knew it wasn't no damn allergies. So I'm just thinking, we need to get Grandma to the hospital because she got all these pre-existing health, health um, issues and I'm hoping they don't take Loretta Devon off this show because I love her on this show. She is too funny. Same grandma. Then we have our second sex scene for this episode. Yes, second sex scene for this episode. Andre and um, Autumn. And I mean, he's mad at her because of, you know, her just coming in and manipulating things. And he lets her know, you only got what you wanted last season because I let you win the auction. Like. You only got that because of me. So she plays into it. Okay, you're the boss. Like, how do you want me kind of thing? And they have sex and it's, you know, a little power dynamic, lots of choking. It was cute. Then we go back to Teak and Lil Murder. 
And it is like the end of like a day of spinning with your boo. And they are sitting on top of this new car over the water, looking at the water, saying, ain't nobody so fancy. I'm just so fresh, so fresh, so clean, clean. Is that the song they were saying? I think so. So they're sitting on the car and they're singing outcast songs. And then Teek starts singing, actually singing. And Lil Murder is like, oh, who's that? He's like, this is one of your songs that you gave to me when I was locked up. And Lil Murder's like, oh, okay, that is nice. But, you know, we find out that I guess somebody attacked Lil Murder, like stabbed him. And he got put in solitary. And Lil Murder feels like when he got out, he was never the same. And so he's been blaming himself for it. And Teek is like, I've had demons for a long time. He saw his mother kill his siblings, his three siblings. And I guess she would have killed him, but he was hiding. And so that kind of started his craziness. And he told him that, you know, the devil spirit was in his mom. It was in the God Boozy that shaped him. And now it's in him. And Lil Murder was telling him, it's not in you. Like, that's your past. And Teek is saying, you know, there's no light in me left. It's gone. And Lil Murder is finally like admitting to himself what I think he's known pretty much this entire day because it has felt like he's been with Teek this day to watch him. He knows he's like on edge, very sensitive. And he's telling him, you know, I see the light in you. And it's sad because Lil Murder is crying and he's basically fighting for his life, even though Teek is resolved in his decision. And we see that he's resolved in it. There's no change that's about to happen. And... We also know it's been cover coming. Like, like I said, his emotions have been sitting on the surface of his skin. He's been irrational and we keep feeling the overwhelm that he has. Like even just the way they shoot everything with him, it's all crazy. And Teague is like, get out the car. He won't get out the car. And you know, if you've ever had depression like I have, not to the point of like being suicidal, but just seriously depression and having that wave come over you and knowing that feeling even just having a small like reference for it I feel so bad for Teak to understand like how much overwhelm must be over him and I in that moment I don't know what they could have done for Teak maybe they could have called somebody I don't know but it once they were in that car alone Teak's already in possession of his gun and he's feeling that way it really wasn't much that Lil Murder could do it at that moment. Like, it, Teek really would have had to have wanted it. And Teek just wanted, like, a release. And I'm like, this man is going to shoot himself with Lil Murder in the car if he don't get out. And that's what he does. Like, the they pull the camera away, and we see the outside of the car. And we hear the gun go off. And then there's nothing for a second. And then Lil Murder gets out, and he is outside of the car, blood on him frantic but quiet and it's like the other episode when Terika is silently crying and the woman that raised her is hysterically laughing Lil Murder is silently suffering like and in shock and then we cut to Mercedes upset and her doorbell rings and it's her daughter Terika coming in hysterically crying because now she's in the spot her mother was in and she's pregnant in the very end Lil Murder goes to Clifford's house and grandma opens the door and I'm like grandma's still in the hospital she all coughing take grandma to the hospital and now Cliff has two people to take care of grandma can tell he's not okay Cliff is looking at him like oh my god you're not okay and little murder finally says I'm not okay and he wasn't and that's how it goes off so this episode was really heavy um I think this is a changing point in the story like people's lives are, at this point are really really different Mississippi is trapped. Um, Mercedes basically, I, I think this is like the first trick she tried to turn and she got played. Like, Hoenn is not for her. Hoenn is for Roulette. <laughs> Leave it for Roulette. Roulette might be in a relationship. Andre and Autumn have something going on. They might be acquiring the money that they want for the pink. The casinos might be going up. What is that going to mean for Clifford? Clifford is now got to take care of grandma. Hopefully she'll be okay. If she's not, that's going to be a whole thing. And Lil Murder, who has gone through this traumatic experience. And how is that going to affect Lil Murder, his tour and all that? I think he'll use it for his music. Like, I think he's talented like that and we'll get some good stuff. But I don't know about his own mental health. We're going to have to see how that all plays out. But this was a seriously, seriously heavy episode. Um, to lighten it up, we're going to do a tutorial. We saw 
roulette when she was showing off. She did a stand on the pole and she did that into like, like laid out standing, like a little ex person on the pole. We're not going to do all that. We're going to do an intro to stepping up on the pole because we're all about helping beginners on this channel. So you will not be doing all that craziness right away, but I am going to help you prep for it and show you how to transition a move that you can use in your pole dancing. So let's take it to the pole. Okay, so stepping onto the pole. This is a move that looks really impressive. It can be a transitional move. You can do a lot of things with it. It can be a very basic move or basic-ish, and it can be really advanced. So I'm gonna teach you how to start the process of doing this move. So for your pole step ups, the thing to remember is to keep your bottom leg that you're gonna step on too low. You don't wanna bring it up too high because then you're gonna have to step really high. Also your outside leg, the one that's not gonna be uh, stepping onto the pole first, that arm is going to be on top. So you don't want to start with your leg up here. You want to start with it about hip height and you want to have the foot like centered in the pole. And then you're going to pull the pole toward you and you're going to tip your head toward the floor like you're pouring water out of your ear and you want to keep your head down as you step up. As you bring your head down, it's going to allow your leg to be straighter and to hook onto the pole. Another thing to remember is that as you step onto the pole, your foot is going to turn horizontal. So it's going to go from here to here. So be prepared for the rotation. So I'm going to show you what it's going to look like. So this is an example of me having the wrong arm on top. It caused a lot of traffic and it felt really scary. So pay attention to that. So once I come up, you can pose here. You can bring this leg up, lay out. Let's see. You could come into a Superman. Another option going from your step up would be to come into a genie position. Also from your step up, you can come into a pull up. And of course from your pull up, you can go into a straddle invert. Another option, you can go from your step up into an inner thigh sit. From there, of course, you could lay back or you can just take an arch. You have so many options, really, even at a beginner level. So what did you think of pole step ups? It's a little scary, but not as scary as it looks and is a lot of fun. So I hope you enjoyed that one. Let me know what you guys are thinking of the series and if there are any other shows that you want me to review. And I'll see you guys soon for the next one. Bye.